Our scripture in this morning is in the book of Psalms, in chapter 32. I'll actually be reading down to verse 7. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7. Psalm of David, verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. When you see Selah, that means pause. Just think about what you just read. And a neat thought. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. We're in the book of Luke, once again, Luke chapter 11. And Jesus is giving instruction in this section that we are looking at on how to talk to God, because that's what he's being asked. How do we pray? How do we commune with God? What do we say when we talk to God? And he tells these disciples the Lord's Prayer. You are familiar with this in verses, chapter 11 of Luke, verses 2 through 4. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Um, If you've been with us as we've been studying this prayer line by line for the last few weeks, uh, every one of these petitions convicts us on how shallow we are in our prayer. Uh, That has really been, uh, I think, evident as we've gone through and explained what these statements mean, uh, what is behind each of these statements. It's not that we just say the exact words that are here, but it's, it's the depth of meaning that each of these statements have that so enriches our time of prayer. And if anything, it convicts me and convicts you that, wow, we really are shallow in thinking about some of these things. And may God deepen our communion with God, our intimacy with God. That is, my, that is the greatest need of my heart and your heart is intimacy and communion with the living God. And the day, Jesus just gives us the words here to, that we need to be thinking about in terms of expressing things to him. I told you last week that we've come to that point in this prayer where the focus changed. Uh, you saw in verse, verse 2, um, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Those were two statements that were focused on God. Uh, God in his glory, uh, God exalting God, glorifying God, thinking of the holiness of God, uh, and and thinking of his greatness and his majesty. Uh, Those are statements, uh, your kingdom come, the advancement of your kingdom, that kingdom that will come when Jesus comes back. That kingdom that I I want to right now submit to in my own heart, to King Jesus. Those two statements focus on God. And then last week we shifted now to the portion of the prayer that the, the, the shift now goes toward me, toward man and his needs. And you see that last week, verse 3, give us each day our daily bread. Then forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Those are about me and and you, us. You're included in that us. I'm included in that us. We're all included in that us. And this is something all of us are to pray. But the focus then begins with God and then moves to us. 
And so prayer is talking to God about God, talking to God about us. And we saw last week that, uh, God, you are the one that must sustain my physical life. And I really say that's a hard thing for you to say in me uh, because it speaks of dependency. And I think most of us don't see ourselves as dependent on God a lot of times. And, uh, but we are. Everything, every breath you take, the food you eat. Uh, we live in a rich culture. We're in a rich society. You're the top ten in the world. All of you in this room are the top ten in the world in terms of wealth and prosperity in the world. And it's a hard prayer for people like us to pray and think about. If we lived in some other cultures, every day would be like that. You don't have extra you don't have a bank account. You don't have savings. You don't have your ability to provide for beyond this day, you know, in terms of going out and working and things like that. And so there is a greater dependency in that. And so it's a greater challenge for us to really speak those words and realize just how dependent we are on God and to give Him thanks. And to realize he could take it away at any moment, as we saw last week. He could just blow it all away. And so, give us this day our daily bread. It's about meeting our physical needs. And that's important. If, I don't have, if I'm not alive, then the next two requests make no sense. I'm dead. I don't care. It's not my concern about it, how I'm doing spiritually in this world. I'm gone. If God doesn't sustain me physically, if you want me to live in this world, God, sustain me physically. And he moves into what we're seeing today in verse 4. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. If food and shelter is your most basic need, as someone has said, to your physical life, get this. Forgiveness of sin, forgiveness of sin is the most basic need to your spiritual existence. You know that? You believe that? The most basic need to your spiritual existence is forgiveness of sin. Our entire lives have been infected by sin. You know this. All of us, everyone. It's a, Infected by sin. Your thoughts, your words, your actions, your added attitudes, your motives, things you do with your bodies, things in your imaginations, your weaknesses, things you do on purpose, the things you don't do on purpose, things you fail to do, things that you do privately. And secretly, and publicly, when you take God's standard, his law, and measure yourself to that, you know you don't live up to that. If you're honest, you, don't, you fall way short of that. You know you do not love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Nobody in this room does that. Nobody loves their neighbor as themselves. Nobody does that perfectly. You don't do it perfectly. We need constant forgiveness. That's what this is about. We need constant forgiveness. I'm praying for my spiritual, excuse me, my physical needs, and now I'm praying for my spiritual needs. We sin, and yet we have a perfect God who forgives. Let me just read a few verses to you to highlight this. Daniel 9, 8. Open shame belongs to us. We have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. This is Daniel chapter 9. Psalm 130. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? Who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I read that psalm to you just a few minutes ago in Psalm 32. You recall what I just said. How blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. You're a blessed person. 
your sins are forgiven and you're not guilty anymore before God. You're a blessed person. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there's no deceit. And David says, I, 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 when I was silent about my sin, I wasted away. I think I can tell you why people are depressed. Guilt. Just guilt. Leads to lots of depression because they don't realize it's sin they need forgiveness for. It's not some condition. Psychological condition. It's a sin. I need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. Because David says, I acknowledge my sin to you. I didn't hide it anymore. I was hiding it for a while, if you know the story. But I stopped hiding it. And I repented of it. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Renaming it is not going to help. Giving it, making it some psychological condition is not going to help. It's sin. It's sin against God. And so Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And just like all these other things, we are to pray regularly for the forgiveness of sin. Hmm. If we need daily bread for our physical needs, we need daily pardon. Daily pardon. You know how you can tell a mature church? You know how you can tell a mature believer? He's aware of his sin. Because the closer he wants to draw to God, the more he sees how sinful he is. And he really begins to appreciate grace more. You follow me? Oh my. Someone who wants to draw closer and closer to God, a holy God, will start to see his sin. He hates it. But then again, he's so thankful for God's grace. All of a sudden, God's grace becomes greater than he ever imagined. So that's what you died for. So that's what you saved me from. I thought I was doing better. Oh my goodness. Where are these motives coming from? Where are these attitudes coming from? Where are these thoughts coming from? Where is all this coming from? That's how you tell a mature church. They know they're sinners. They're aware of their sin. And they're so appreciative of God's grace more and more. Their awareness of sin is great, but their awareness of God's grace is great. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Sometimes I've had people visit our church or call me or want to carry on long, lengthy debates on email, arguing with me about the fact that Christians should not be talking about sin anymore. My first thought is, well, I want to talk to your wife about you. <laughs> I think, how can you tell me Christians don't, have a, don't sin, don't have to deal with sin? Jesus said we do. Father, you're talking to people who can call God their father. And he's telling them, say this in your prayer. How do you do this? There's no sin to confess. That's how you know you're maturing as a Christian. You feel worse. You feel, wow, God, why? Why do I still think like this, talk like this, and act like this? At times, God, I'm so thankful for your grace. So thankful for your grace. This is not a prayer for the unbeliever, okay? Unbeliever cannot call God Father. This is a prayer for a believer. That's what Jesus is giving instruction to. People who believe in him. They're being taught to pray, forgive my sins. 
Let me make a couple of observations before I dive into this. See the word and? None of the other petitions, verse 4, none of the other petitions start out with and, joining it to what's just been said. This is the only one that does that. And a lot of times it wouldn't be too significant, but here it's pretty significant. You know why? You've just been told to pray for your physical needs and immediately, and don't forget your spiritual needs, because it's not all about your physical needs. That's what we have to realize. Yes, pray about your physical needs, but quickly remember it's about your spiritual needs as well. Don't just get focused on your physical needs. Don't watch those prosperity preachers that tell you it's all about improving the outer man. It's not all about that. It's about the inner man. It's about your soul. It's not just your material needs. The outer man is decaying. Inner man is to be renewed day by day. We've got to be focused on that. It's very important. doesn't mean we don't think about our physical needs. We do. God wants us to live in this world. God, we need you to provide. And God, if you want me to live in this world, I need to survive spiritually. I can't become a statistic spiritually. Strengthen my inner man. See, we live in a world that's not concerned about your inner man. Nobody's going to tell you on TV or in magazines or any other places to think about your inner man. They're not going to tell you that. It's all about your outer person fixing that up. We have a concern as Christians that the world does not have. We want intimacy with God. If you're a true child of God, you want intimacy with God. You want to commune with God. That is is why you come to church. This church, especially where the Bible is being taught, you come because you want your soul fed, because you want intimacy with God. You're not wanting fluff. You're not wanting just outer, outer man patchwork done. You want God to do that inward work in you. You want intimacy with God. You want communion with God. You want to enjoy his forgiveness. You want fellowship with God. So God, sustain our spiritual lives. That's what you're saying. Sustain my spiritual life. I can't stand it when I feel distant from God. I can't stand it. When I sin and I feel distant from God, I don't think any true child of God can. Just feel distant. And you go days like that. You may go long periods of time like that. But you can't, st- you know something's wrong. You can't stand it. Fellowship is broken with God, intimacy with God is broken. You know you've grieved the Spirit of God. And so Jesus says, the way you maintain communion with God is you ask God to forgive your sin. Confess our sins. Seek his forgiveness. Let me clarify some things for you that I think are important to clarify. They're good questions that people ask. You notice the verse, it says, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Okay? So two issues that you need to understand so you don't misunderstand. Why does a child of God, a believer, have to ask God for forgiveness of their sins? Why? If we received full forgiveness, full forgiveness, Full forgiveness, past, present, and future forgiveness of all our sin when we came to Christ. Why is there a need to this? Why 
aren't those people who want to carry on that email dialogue with me at times. Why is it that we tell believers, Jesus telling believers to confess their sin? And the second point, and I don't think I'll get to this today, but the second point is this is the only of the uh, petitions that sort of has clarification added to it. For we ourselves, see that? Because we ourselves, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who's indebted to, to us. See that? Why is that there? Why is seeking God's forgiveness tied to, why is seeking God's forgiveness tied to forgiving others? Why? Isn't our forgiveness based on the atonement? Are we saying here that unless you do that, you can't be forgiven? Do we have to somehow earn God's forgiveness by doing something like this? Is that what we're saying? Is that what Jesus is saying in these words? Can I lose my salvation if I don't forgive others? Those are good questions. Matthew even says that. If you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. Matthew's account of this in Matthew 6. If you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. Matthew uses the word forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The word debts is used there. You see it in Luke's account here. You don't see it in the first part, but you see it in the second part. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. I mean, you see the word debt, you think of some kind of financial obligation. Why that word? Um, sin is the same as debt. Sin is used here in Luke in the first part where Matthew uses the word debt. Forgive us our debts. So sin and debt mean the same thing. Used interchangeably. And it refers, like I said, to sin. It refers to um, an offense requiring reparation, a trespass or sin, uh, something required to restore something to a normal state. Debt. Sin is a debt owed to God. It's a moral failure on my part to God. It's a failure in someone's way they've treated me or I've treated them. That's why you call it those that have incurred a debt against me, indebted to me. We're asking God to cancel our debts. That's what we're asking. As I cancel the debts of others toward me, sin trespasses. So, just so you get that clarification, I'm talking about the same thing. None of us have loved God like we should. Or we loved others as we should. We've incurred a debt to God. So, it's important. Let's answer this first question today. Next week, we'll talk about the second question. Why do I have to ask for forgiveness if I've been totally forgiven already? That's a good question. And you need to be able to explain this to others if you, have, if you already know the answer to it. You really do need to understand this. This is important. You have to understand the Bible talks about two types of forgiveness. It talks about judicial forgiveness, the forgiveness of a judge just towards somebody. And it talks about parental forgiveness, a father to a child. Judicial forgiveness, let's start with that one. When a person trusts in Christ, the eternal judge declares a person pardoned. That person deserves punishment, but Jesus and his mercy and his grace paid all those debts for you. All your debts. Your past, present, future debts all paid for. All your sins for all time are paid for in Christ. That's judicial forgiveness. That's justification before God. That is declaring you right before God. 
He paid the sin and the debt of every believer. You trust him alone for salvation, and you're justified. You get this alien righteousness of Jesus. His, this righteousness that's outside of you, imputed to you. He gets your sin, you get his righteousness. Your status before God is forgiven. He's a just God, and he's a merciful God. He's just in that he must judge sin. He judged that in Christ. He is merciful in that he cared about you and me as believers his elect, his church. Mercy and justice kissed each other at the cross. In him we have redemption through his blood. There's debt language right there. Redemption, bought back. In in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. That's Ephesians 1.7. Colossians 2, listen to this. Colossians 2. When When a criminal was crucified on a cross, there was a plaque put behind his head of the charges of his crime. Right? You could walk by, see that guy hanging on a cross, and behind him would be a plaque that said, this guy did this. God placed a plaque behind Jesus' head in a spiritual sense here. It basically went like this. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all your transgressions. Get this in verse 14 of Colossians Colossians 2. Having canceled out the certificate of debt. That's the plaque. God paid for that. All your sin was on that plaque. All my sin was on the plaque. God canceled it all out in Christ. He's taken it out of the way. He's nailed it to the cross. 1 John 2.12, I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven. To two believers, he is writing, your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. And then Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, you will never face the wrath of God. Jesus took that for you. Jeremiah 31, 34, just basically part of the new covenant says this, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. It's not that God has a bad memory, it is that God no longer holds it against you. That's what he means. No longer holds that against you. Psalm 103, 12, the east from the west. That's infinity, by the way. Infinity. That's how far he has removed your transgressions from you. And you can't lose this. You can't ever enter into a state of unforgiveness before God in this judicial sense. John 10, 27 Jesus is saying, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They don't do it perfectly, by the way, but they follow him. They know his voice, and they follow him. His sheep know his voice, and they follow him. Then he says this, I give eternal life to them, and get this, they will never perish, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. And then he says this, My Father who has given them to me, your gift to Christ from the Father, by the way. The Father gave you to Jesus. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Listen, this is eternal security, okay? You're in Jesus' hand, you're in the Father's hand, and nobody can snatch you out of their hands. And the Spirit of God has sealed you. You can never be, have a status of unforgiven before God. If you're a Christian, if you know Christ, if you're in Jesus Christ. Some people say, I don't like this doctrine. Of, this doctrine of eternal security is dangerous because you're giving Christians the license to sin. I don't know anybody that teaches this doctrine, by the way, that, thinks, that teaches that. 
that was a big thing the Roman Catholic Church had against the, Ref the Reformers. On the doctrine of justification, God declares you righteous. This doesn't give you license to sin, no. What he does, folks, he gives you new desires. What he does is you become a partaker of the divine nature. What he does is he puts his Holy Spirit in you that gives you holy desires. We desire to obey him. It's not that he saves us and drags us kicking and screaming, m m telling us we've got to do something we don't want to do. No, he, he inclines our heart towards himself. He makes us willing. He makes us willing. We've, we struggle, yes. We struggle with sin, yes. We desire to obey him. We abhor what is evil, but we fail. We all fail. Turn to Titus 2, verse 11 and 14. I'm just trying to show you that and rather than seeing this grace and this, this justification as a license to sin, we, we don't see it that way. The true believer doesn't see it that way. Titus 2, 11 through 14. Notice it says in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Notice what the grace of God does. The grace of God instructs. It teaches us to deny ungodliness. That's the negative side of it, but it instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And positively, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Folks, if you have truly been saved by grace... This grace has instructed you that way. It's not a grace that says, go do what you want to do. It's a grace that instructs you to deny ungodliness. You tell me you know Jesus and you don't care about godliness, and I would say you don't know Jesus. You don't know this grace because this grace instructs you to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We don't do it perfectly. But that's what it does. That's why those that say it's a license to sin say, no, it's not a license to sin. Out of a heart of gratitude. Notice it goes on to say, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem from every lawless deed, to redeem us from every lawless deed. Notice, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. That's what this grace is all about. Purifying a people, zealous for good deeds. Remember that illustration I gave you when we're going through Romans? Remember I told you it's like going to class. So you're in the university and you're in a class, signed up for a class. You go to that class and the first day of class, the instructor says everybody in this class has got an A. Remember that illustration? Everybody gets an A. That's not going to change. Everybody gets an A. Now, start acting like an A student. Come to class. Do the homework. Do all those things. But even if you fail to do it, you're not trying to earn this A. You already got the A. You're not trying to earn it. But act like an A student. It's not the perfect best illustration, but it, it, really, it really helps you see. You've, you've already been declared right before God. If Someone asked a question one time. They said, if I sin and I don't confess that sin right away and I, the rapture happens, am I forgiven? To which somebody responded, no, you're not forgiven. You didn't confess that sin. That's wrong. That's wrong. If you're a believer, it's not a matter of confessing a sin that makes you right before God. You've already done that. You've already been bathed in his righteousness and clothed in his righteousness that's the reason on our membership application, people 
want to join our church, we ask them, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you as a Christian how do, that you will, if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? The only right answer to that is a 10. Because I got an A in the course the day I came to Jesus. My standing before God is perfectly righteous because of Christ. That is judicial forgiveness. That is your standing before God. Nothing can change that. Nothing can take that away. As to what God has done in you. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, you can call God your Father. You can call God your Father. I'm not, when I say, Father, forgive me for my sin, I'm not asking him to justify me again. You follow that? That's not what you're asking for in the Lord's Prayer. You're not asking God to justify you again. You're not asking God to let you into the family again. You're already in the family. That's your standing. You don't need to save me again. That's not what I'm asking. When I say forgive our sin, as I'm forgiving those who sin against me, I'm not asking God to justify me again. I'm asking the second type of forgiveness that I've alluded to already. It's the forgiveness of a father to a child. It's parental forgiveness. It's not one that sustains us in our position before God, but in our practice, in our usefulness to God, in our intimacy with God, in our communion with God, in our fellowship with God. That's what we're talking about in this. Nothing can interrupt judicial forgiveness, but I do a lot of things that interrupt parental forgiveness. And so do you. And that's why Jesus says, confess your sin. Because you got it. And you need to confess your sin. To maintain joy, to maintain fellowship, to maintain usefulness to God. To maintain a warmth of forgiveness. Knowing I'm forgiven. Not perfect in our practice. And that's why I need to confess my sin. I'm perfect in my standing before God because of Jesus, but not in my practice. I'm not, and neither are you. When your child rebels against you, you know something's wrong. Uh, Something goes out of the relationship immediately. It's just not the same. The warmth of that relationship is not there. The joy of that relationship is not there. The closeness of that relationship is not there. Until there's repentance, until there's forgiveness given. Okay, John 1.8. You're familiar, 1 John 1.8. You're familiar with these verses. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin... We're deceiving ourselves. I want to tell you something. This is written to Christians. I I don't know where people think any books of the Bible are written to non-believers. Only believers. this This is a Christian's book. Okay? This is written to us. And these words are written to believers. If you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in us. But, and he's giving evidences of what a true believer is, if we are those who are confessing our sins, if we are those who are in agreement with God about our sin, if we are those who are agreeing with God of our need to repent of our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those are all continuous action words in there. He's continually doing this, folks, because I'm continually a mess. It's conditional, yes. This is conditional, yes. I must confess this to God. That's why Jesus says to do this. It doesn't change my status. 
affects incredibly my relationship in terms of fellowship, warmth, and intimacy, and communing with God. And I tell you what, I can't stand it when I feel distant from God. Romans 7, Paul struggled. Things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I don't do. Confess means you agree with God. Confess means you say, I'm the one responsible, not my wife, not my boss, not my neighbors, not anybody else. I'm the problem here, God. If it isn't me who directly committed, if it's, it's how I'm responding to it even, is what, maybe that's the sin. Let me close with this. Let me show you an example of this. Go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. <clears throat> David, we would all agree, David was a believer. He wrote the Psalm 32 we just read a few minutes ago. Uh, he wrote many of the Psalms. David was a believer. In fact, he was a man after God's own heart. He sinned greatly. He sinned greatly um, in lots of different ways. But what we note here in this particular Psalm 51 is he sinned against God but the sin with Bathsheba. He, he lusted after her. He committed adultery with her. And he, to cover it all up, he murdered her husband. Now, I want you to see how eventually David deals with this. So you get a picture here of what I'm trying to talk about in terms of parental forgiveness. This is called a psalm of penitence. Let me say that in your Bible. But here's something that David knew. Look at verse 11 of Psalm 51. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Okay, David could not say that if he were not a believer. You understand that? Can you see that? Only a believer could say that. He's a believer that doesn't want to be taken away from God's presence. He's a believer that doesn't want to lose the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want, he doesn't want any of that to happen to him. That's his prayer. I've grieved you, I've grieved your spirit, I've grieved sin against you. He's one whose sins have been, his, he's one whose sins will, will, future, be nailed to the cross. The Old Testament looked forward to the cross. He's experienced the presence of God in his life. He's seen God work. He's had the Spirit of God use him in many ways. And now he knows what he has done. He just... It's just not there. There's a wall between us because of what I have done. He knows he's a child of God and he cries out these things. Look at verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Go back to verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. God, I want the joy back. That's what you lose is the joy. I want the joy back. And then verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. I want the joy back so I can be used again by you, God. See, Unclean vessel, God can't use. God, I, I want the joy back. Restore that to me. Give me a willing spirit. And God, I, I want to be used to tell others about you. I can't do that unless you restore to me the joy of my salvation. See, sin had caused him to lose that joy, that peace, that confidence. His testimony, everything. Go to verse 1 of 51, Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. 
Be, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. See, this is, he's crying out for forgiveness. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I can't get this out of my mind. I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. No matter, whatever you do to chasten me, God, you're just in doing it. Um, Because I've sinned. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. I can't stand the pain. I can't stand the guilt. I can't stand what it's doing to my physical body. As we read in Psalm 32, all my life juices are gone. I feel useless and hopeless. I'm in darkness. I'm depressed. Whatever. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. I love this last verse, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart. This isn't the prayer of a guy that's asking for salvation. He's already a saved man. He is asking God, God, I need a clean heart. I, got a clean, I need a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. He wants the joy back. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. To those who can call God their father, because they're right with God already. They're standing before God. They're adopted into God's family. You belong to God. He says, ask God to forgive you for your sins. So you keep the joy, maintain the fellowship, maintain your usefulness, the confidence. Hmm. We're to continually pray that, Father, forgive us our sins because they interrupt our fellowship and they steal our joy and rob our gladness and take away our song and, as somebody said, and tamper with our usefulness and hinder our testimony. That's what it does. And see, Nathan, the prophet, eventually comes to David and says to David, the Lord has put away your sin. And David says, blessed to the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, Psalm 32. God gave him back his joy. Listen, repentance, repentance is a key to joy. It's the key to usefulness. It's the, repentance is such a key. It's why so many quote, counseling methods out there never get to the issue, sin, and the need to repent of sin. It's always somebody else's fault. It's always something else besides sin. And I submit to you, I think the reason we live with so much in terms of people that are just, with so much guilt is because it's, it's real guilt. It's sin against the holy God. And we need to repent. I'm not saying everything, in, please don't get me wrong on that, but the point is, so much of it is. So much of it is. Unconfessed sin among believers. An unwillingness to forget, confess sin. I think this is a great psalm to, to, to we can use. Just pray often to God if you can't think of what to say. Confession of sin is the evidence of being a believer. That's why I showed you in 1 John. And that's what we are to be doing, confessing sin, because we deal with sin all the time. And, that's sin, and, and folks, as you grow in your Christian life, you're, you should be more appreciative of God's grace all the time, that he would love a sinner like you. And he would do all this and die for a sinner like you. If, you're, if you say you're a believer and sin never bothers you, you've got to do some evaluating here. If you really do know the grace that instructs us to deny ungodliness. All right. Verse 4 also says of Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 11, excuse me, verse 4. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. We've established the fact that the two kinds of forgiveness in the Bible, judicial and parental, and that Luke 11.4 is talking about parental forgiveness to believers. 
And then we have this clarification by Christ or this addition on this statement by Christ, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And so the question then becomes, what does this mean? The question becomes, does this make God's forgiveness toward us conditional? Do I have to earn God's forgiveness by doing this? And there's lots of questions about forgiveness that come out of that statement. And so next week I want to take talk about forgiving others in the context of this passage. That'll be for next time. So you be here. Don't leave here with just half of the message or half the verse. You've got to hear the whole thing. So be here next week. God, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. God, this is just a refreshing, refreshing thought. It's hard, God, no doubt, but it's so refreshing to know, God, that we can know the joy of forgiveness in our relationship with you for any sin that we commit as a believer, any sin that you provide forgiveness. It doesn't always mean the consequences aren't going to still be with us. They are, many times. But Father, the forgiveness is always available. It's always available to us because of Christ. And we thank you for that, and we praise you for that. And I would pray that we will be a mature church that understands that though we sin, we can find repentance, find in repentance and confession, forgiveness and usefulness to God. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.